I invite you to remain standing that we might hear God's holy word together today as it is recorded in the Gospel of John. Hear now these words. This is my commandment, love each other just as I have loved you. No one has greater love than to give up one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I commanded you. I don't call you servants any longer because servants don't know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends because everything I heard from my father I have made known to you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you could go and produce fruit and so that your fruit could last. As a result, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give to you. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, the story goes that Abraham Lincoln was riding home from church one Sunday. And he was discussing the sermon that he had just heard. He said, now, the reverend was very well prepared. He had a thoughtfully constructed sermon, but he lacked the most important ingredient. The preacher never asked us to do anything great. Wow. We are not to be just hearers of the word, but we are to be doers of the word. And so today I am going to ask you to do something great. All right? Are you ready? You know, this is Super Bowl Sunday, and I put the word football in my sermon title. But as Coach Tony Dungy once said, as big a deal as the Super Bowl is, it's not the most important thing going on in the planet. And so you also see the word love in our sermon title today. Because today's sermon comes down to one key ingredient, and it's really not that complicated. But I'm going to pose this main point to you in the form of a question, a question that our district superintendent, Fran Elrod, asked all of the clergy in the Columbia District when she first arrived here. And I'm going to ask you that question three different times throughout the sermon today in hopes that it will be cemented in all of our minds and reverberate throughout the days ahead. But first, I also need to recognize that since this is February, it is Black History Month. And since today is the day that so many people have football on their minds, I want to share with you a story about the first African-American coach in the NFL. Does anybody know who that was? I hear some murmuring. People are trying to think, who is that? Well, his name is Frederick Doug Douglass Pollard. Anybody get it right? His friends called him Fritz. He played in college for Brown University, that prestigious Ivy League school. And back in those days, Ivy League schools were the powerhouses in football. He played quarterback and several other positions in the backfield. And in 1916, he led the Browns to play in the Rose Bowl. They won against Washington. And he played so well that he was named All-American in that game, the second African-American to ever be named All-American athlete in any college sport. Now, after college, he decided he wanted to go to dental school and become a dentist. 
but the Akron P Pro football team contacted him to see if he wanted to play for them. They had noticed what an outstanding player he was. Now, pro football was not a big deal back then. Most people just watched college games, and the NFL wasn't even in existence at that time. But some people had started paying attention to pro football, and so Fritz decided to accept their offer and play for them. He played quarterback that first year, and in his second year, 1920, he led the Akron Pros to an undefeated season. They became the world champions in football. The next year, he was asked to not only continue playing quarterback, but to also coach the team. From what I understand, back then, players were often the ones who were promoted to coach and asked to be coaches as well as players on the team. And so he became not only an African-American who was playing as quarterback in a professional team, but also coaching that team. That team in its second year became part of the American Football Association and two years later the American Football Association became the NFL. Now I mention all of that for a couple of reasons. One is it cost him something to do that. Back then football players were not paid like they are today. He could have made a lot more money as a dentist than he could as a football player so he didn't become a football player for the Akron pros because of the money. He did it because he wanted to break down the barriers. He wanted to break down the barriers and prove that African Americans could play football just as well as our Caucasian players. And secondly, I share this story with you because it not only cost him something, but here's the thing. He was only able to play for five years and coach for five years. And the reason for that is because in 1926, all the African-American players in the NFL were let go. And in 1933, the owners of all of the NFL teams got behind closed doors, and they had an agreement that none of them would hire any more African-Americans to play professional football. For the next 13 years, no African-American played in the NFL. Some of the best players in college football at the time were African-Americans, and yet they were not allowed to play professional football. In 1946, when the stadiums were being built to buy taxpayer dollars, African Americans began to say, if our tax money is going to be used to build these stadiums, then no one has any right to deny us being able to play in those stadiums. After Frederick Douglass Pollard left professional football in 1926, my friends, it was 46 years before another African-American played quarterback in the NFL. And it took another 21 years, not until 1989, before another African-American was named as a head coach of an NFL team. Now, I know that's a long story. And you're probably sitting there going, uh, I thought we were talking about love and church. But here's the thing, here's what I realized as I read that story, is that people can come and break down barriers, just like he did, but that those barriers can be so quickly re-erected. Barriers can come down but in this world, it is so easy to see barriers that once were broken down being re-erected. Barriers that, that separate us, that separate the haves from the have-nots, that separate us as people of God. And you don't have to think too long to realize that in our society, 
There are seemingly countless occasions for division and discord separating us. It's amazing to me how much people can hate and be fearful of other people just because those people don't look the same, talk the same, act the same, or think the same as they do. And out of that hate and fear, we erect emotional, social, and physical barriers between one another. I'm very aware that I am about to journey to the Holy Land where there are indeed physical barriers separating Israelis from Palestinians. And it's heartbreaking. I know it will be heartbreaking when I see those walls. And we don't have to look very far in our own country. Those of you who remember the events of September 11th, remember how that brought to our consciousness the great walls that exist here between the three great religions of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And how incredibly sad it is to realize that all three of these great religions share in a common patriarch, Abraham. So whether we're talking about laws and regulations related to perpetuating systemic racism, immigration reform, women's health care, you name it, walls are being erected, and in some cases they are being re-erected after people sacrificed so much to tear them down. And we, as a result, are being pushed further and further apart from one another as the children of God. But here's the thing. Jesus came to break down all of the barriers that separate us from one another. Jesus came to dismantle the walls between genders and between religions, between races, between social classes, and yes, even between saints and sinners. That's why Jesus came, to express God's love to each one of us as God's beautiful creation, to destroy the walls and remove the barriers that keep us from loving one another as Christ loves us. As the scripture text before us today in verse 12 states, Jesus gave us one commandment before his own death on a cross. His commandment was simple. Love one another as I have loved you. That's the task of our church. That's the task that I am proud to say Washington Street United Methodist Church has embraced in our mission statement and in our open hearts, open minds, and open doors. Several years ago, I read an article by Leonard Sweet in which he said this. He said, the greatest decision facing the 21st century church is whether it will function as a law-based community of faith or as a grace-based community of love. Will we be defined by some carefully articulated, theologically sophisticated, logically delineated articles of faith? Or will the church welcome its role as a living, breathing, healing, helping organism known for its acts of love? Jesus said, they will know you are my disciples by the way you love one another. And the fact is, if we are genuinely to be the church, if we are to be the true body of Christ in this community as witnesses, we have no choice in the matter. Christ commands us to live a life of faith, not by legalistic principles, but by love. Instead of a series of laws, Jesus declared that we are to live according to the mandate of love. So here's that question Fran Elrod asked us. It gets at the heart of our message today. What can love do here? What can love do here today? One of the sad truths of our history as a people of faith is that people who profess to follow Christ are the ones who have helped to erect walls that separate people rather than tearing them down. 
people throughout the church history have shut people out because of race, sometimes because of gender. We've shut people out, like the current debate in our denomination, over the ways that we think about things. Judging certain people is not meeting our approval for one reason or another. And in doing so, the church has done unbelievable harm to some innocent and precious souls. An online Harvard News survey several months ago reported this, that since the pandemic, there are increasing numbers of persons who lack community and connection. There is an epidemic of loneliness and anxiety in our world today. That report said 61% of young adults and 51% of mothers of young children say they feel serious loneliness. And this epidemic of loneliness and lack of community is leading to early mortality rates and a wide array of physical and emotional problems like depression and anxiety, heart disease, substance abuse, and domestic violence. So here's that question again. What can love do here, today, in the face of this isolation, this loneliness? I'm getting ready for this plane trip, packing my luggage. And I thought about how sometimes people lose their luggage. Have you ever lost your luggage? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Y'all are making me think I really will lose my luggage. <laughs> it's frustrating to lose your luggage. I've only had it lost one time before. But let me tell you what I learned about lost luggage as I, as I tried to prepare myself for that. In most cases, a lost piece of luggage is returned eventually, they say. But every year, there are thousands of items that are lost or left behind at American airports. Eventually, all of those lost items, you know what happens to them? They end up in Scottsboro, Alabama, at an unclaimed baggage center. And the unclaimed baggage center is located in this huge warehouse. Thousands of items. Any piece of luggage that is left behind on an airplane ends up there, and then it is sold to the general public. So you can go in there and you can buy cell phones and CD players and laptops and iPads and jewelry. Absent-minded passengers have also left behind such things as a bag of rare Egyptian artifacts. Lost precious items. Well, as I thought about that, I thought, you know, that's what the church ought to be. We ought to be a place like that big warehouse. We ought to be a place in society where anyone who feels like they are lost and alone can come and be named and claimed by the God who created them. We ought to be that place that opens up the doors and welcomes all those dear souls who have been injured and hurt and who feel so alone in this world and lost. That's really what attracted me to this multimedia campaign known as He Gets Us. In stating the intent of that campaign, in case you haven't seen the ads, the intent of that campaign on its website says, it is our hope that you see how Jesus experienced challenges and emotions just like we do. We want these ads to provide people with the knowledge that there is a safe place to ask questions, including tough ones. We are about sharing Jesus' openness to people that others might have excluded. His message went out to all people. And though you may see religious people as often hypocritical or judgmental, know that Jesus saw that in the religious leaders of his day too. And he didn't like it either. 
Instead, Jesus taught and offered radical compassion and stood up for the marginalized. Ultimately, we want people through this campaign to know Jesus' teachings and how he lived while he was here on earth. And that will be a starting point for people to understand Jesus' true message. Well, my friends, some of you have already discovered this that as attractive as that ad campaign is, unfortunately, the people funding that massive campaign, while most of them remain anonymous, it has come to light that some of the sources who have identified themselves are the very people whose actions do not align with the openness, the compassion, and acceptance loudly proclaimed in that campaign's message. So once again, I ask that question, what can love do here? The ads are out there, I can't stop them. In answering that question, I couldn't simply dismiss those ads as a slick image improvement campaign for those persons whose lives and actions have not aligned with this message. And I couldn't just block and scroll through the ads and pretend that they weren't out there. And I don't want to just engage in analyzing and critiquing and criticizing the people who funded the campaign, questioning their motives. Here's why. Because the reality is that campaign is speaking to real people with real hurts and real needs. People who feel lonely and full of anxiety and feel isolated and who need community and healing and hope and forgiveness and love that I know can be found in communities like this one. The ads convey that they can find what they are seeking in Christ. And people are indeed attracted to these ads. I have already received seven text messages in response to those ads when I listed Washington Street as a church community that would receive and engage in conversation with persons who respond to those ads. And I have met personally with some of those persons and engaged in meaningful conversations with them about real issues, real hurts, and real pains. So here's where I've landed. I want you to look in your bulletin today, and you will notice at the bottom, there is a big block that says Jesus is in the Super Bowl. And halfway down, you'll see, I say that here's how you can get involved to equip yourself to have conversations after the game. What can love do here? Here's what I think love can do. Even when I don't want to be associated with persons who have backed this campaign, I want to be a beacon of love for the people who respond to these ads. So I want to ask you, love, to me, calls us to pray for this campaign, that no harm will be done to persons who respond to the ads, that only healing, hope, love, acceptance, forgiveness, and peace, and joy will come to the persons who are in need of those gifts. Of Christ. And secondly, I believe that love calls us to serve as one of the churches who are responding to those persons in an active way. We are blessed that there are several United Methodist clergy connected with this congregation, and some of them have already told me that they are willing to respond and engage as first responders with persons who text us in response to these ads. Engaging in conversation with these precious souls who are hurting and helping to be the voice of healing and hope and love in their lives, affirming them. I also believe that love is calling each of us 
to talk about these ads after the Super Bowl, just like you talk about other commercials after the Super Bowl. Maybe share with family and friends what the ads mean to you, and if you hear criticism about who is sponsoring it and funding it, I hope you will also remember that question, what can love do here? What can love do here? We can reach out and be a response to the needs that are touched by those ads. You never know how your simple sharing about these ads might be used by God in meaningful ways to also bring healing and hope to persons you encounter. You know, not long before Mother Teresa died, she spoke to a national prayer breakfast in Washington, D.C. She was introduced at that prayer gathering as the greatest woman in the world. And she dismissed that at the gathering, saying if she was the greatest woman in the world, God would have made her tall enough to reach the podium. But then she went on to say, I am nothing close to being the greatest woman in the world, but I'll tell you the greatest thing about my life. I've been able to be a tiny pencil in the hand of God, someone through whom God writes love letters to the world. Jesus commanded us to love one another, and so as we see the pain and the hurt in the lives of those around us, let us not be afraid to ask, what can love do here? And then, like Mother Teresa, let us dedicate ourselves to being a tiny pencil in the hands of God and writing love letters to this world. May we have the faith and the courage to so live. In the name of our Creator, our Redeemer, and our Sustainer. Amen.